message is called Running to Rest. So, can you imagine what it would be like to be in a position where you were forced to run for your life? Kind of like, you know, I love watching those old Western movies with Clint Eastwood and all those where, you know, they would form a posse. I love the posse. The posse just seems like, you got a problem? Just form a posse. A posse fixes everything. And they would come after you, right? Vigilante justice. And they would go after the bad guy. Well, the closest, look at this picture up here. Let me explain. The closest I can relate to running for my life was when I played Capture the Flag when I was a kid. It was horrifying, right? So you understand how the game was played. You cross that line, and they could pull your flag, and if you get your flag pulled, you have to go to jail. But if you made it to that little area where the corner where the flag is, it was like a safe area, like a safe place of refuge where you could get in. We would dive in, you know, and just get in, and then you wait for the opportunity to get the flag and take it across, right? You see this uh, little kid with the yellow jacket running for his life? It's, it's horrifying. It's traumatic. Look at him. He's a dog. <laughs> But I love the game of Capture the Flag, right? Because Capture the Flag had two places of refuge. You could be on your side, or if you ventured into the other side, the only other place of refuge would be where the flag is. In the whole other area, they can come after you, and they did. But what if it were real life? You're running for your life, and there is no safe zone. No refuge. How exhausting would life be if you were constantly running for your life? The fact of the matter is, outside of Jesus, that is your spiritual condition for everyone ever born. Running for your life, and you don't even realize it. Spiritually, we are all running for our lives and searching for refuge, where we can escape the real threat and find the place that provides our only true hope. That's what we're going to be talking about today, is our desperate need for refuge when we're running for our life and where we can go to get it. We're doing the entire chapter of Joshua today, Joshua chapter 20. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Say to the people of Israel, appoint cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses. We'll see that later. He, he predicted that this would be a necessity in the book of Numbers. That the manslayer who strikes any person without intent or kills someone by accident or unknowingly may flee there to a city of refuge. They shall be for you a refuge from the avenger of blood. He shall flee to one of these cities and shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and explain his case to the elders of that city. Then they shall take him into the city and give him a place, and he shall remain with them. And if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not give up the manslayer into his hand, because he struck his neighbor unknowingly and did not hate him in the past. He shall remain in that city until he stands before the congregation for judgment, until the death of him who is high priest at the time. Then the manslayer may return to his, home his own town and his home. So... Before, I'm, I'm not going to read the part where it says where all the cities of refuge were located. I'm just going to give you this map and say, you can see where the cities of refuge are on stars. They were strategically spread out and located all throughout the land. Okay? And the design was that never was a city more than a day's journey from anywhere else in Canaan. And that's where all these cities are, right? So I'm going to, instead of reading the towns, which I can't pronounce anyway, I'm just going to put them all up there, and you can see where the cities of refuge were. Now look at the rest of our passage today. Let's go to the next. These were the cities that designated for all the people of Israel and for the strangers sojourning among them. So Jews and non-Jews could take advantage of these cities of refuge. That anyone who killed a person without intent could flee there, so he might not die by the hand of the avenger of blood, till he stood before the congregation. Okay, I want to talk about the historical significance of these cities of refuge. They were, in fact, a divine provision from God. They were an expression of how his justice and his mercy would be different than the rest of the world. And God made this provision because he knew that humans have a thirst for vengeance. We have a thirst for justice as we see it. We can all relate to that, right? 
But this system was designed to put vengeance on hold until the situation could be evaluated and justice could be served proportionally. Most of Numbers 35, in fact, contains God's specific demand given years before they even entered the land of Canaan for what these cities would be. Look at Numbers chapter 35, starting with verse 10. Tell the people of Israel, when you cross the Jordan into Canaan, he says, when, the, when you cross, this is one of the things you're going to do. Select cities to be refuge, so the manslayer who kills anyone without intent may flee there. So the accused may not die until he stands before the congregation for judgment. You should give six cities as cities of refuge. These cities shall be for refuge for the people of Israel and the stranger and the sojourner among them. Anyone who kills any person without intent may flee there. So you can see this was something God planned beforehand. So these six cities of refuge were among 48 other cities throughout the land of Canaan who were given to the Levitical priesthood, those who were serving as intercessors between God and his people. They were strategically located, so no matter where you lived, a city of refuge was never more than a day away. They provided a place of refuge always within reach for anyone who might need it, even sojourners and people who did not believe in God. And here's how they worked, right? If, if someone accidentally killed another person, the family of the person who was killed had the right to pursue and hold the killer responsible. It's called the Avenger of Blood. And this Avenger of Blood was appointed, and it was usually a prominent family member, and they had the responsibility to bring the killer to justice. So they would gather their posse, and they would pursue and, and hunt the accused, Hunt them down until they caught them and they take revenge in the name of the family. So the accused has two choices, right? You can run, or you can form your own posse and begin a brutal blood like Jewish Hatfield and McCoy's kind of thing. Here's the problem, the blood feuds extended to every family member, even extended family, and they could last for generations. Cities of refuge were an opportunity to present or prevent this bloody cycle. They provided a way for the accused to avoid the fight and seek protection and restoration and real justice. And the elders of the city would hear the case, and if it was ruled a murder, they would just turn the killer over to the avenger of blood and justice would be served. But if the elders ruled the death was accidental, the accused was given safe refuge as long as he remained inside, he couldn't go out of the city like to Starbucks or something. He had to stay in the city. Had to stay. As long as he remained in the city, he was safe. But if the accused left the city, the adventure of blood is now lawfully allowed to take revenge. However, whoever the sitting high priest was at the time, once that high priest died, there was a law that the slate would be wiped clean for all refuge cases in all the refuge cities, and everything begins again. Over this period, emotions probably could have cooled a little bit. Maybe the thirst for revenge has, has waned, or maybe even perhaps there's healing and forgiveness that has taken place. And now everyone can go back to life as normal. If the avenger of blood tried to enact revenge after that, now they're guilty of murder. And the accused by the law could then leave the city and return home without fear of retribution from the avenger of blood. So that's the history of cities of refuge. Look at the theology. I want you to see how our God is a God of refuge. The theme of God, and this is rich throughout scripture, the theme of God providing refuge to his people occurs constantly in the Old Testament and the New Testament. As a matter of fact, as I was studying the theme and the thread of refuge throughout Scripture, it was overwhelming the sheer volume of it. And these cities of refuge provide so many beautiful glimpses of Jesus, our ultimate refuge for sinners, and glimpses of his church there are so many, I can't cover them all in one sermon, but I'm just going to give you a few of my favorites, okay? The first one is, I want you to see the cities of refuge reveal to us, theologically, our need for refuge. So why, think about this, 
why does Israel need six cities of refuge for accidental killings? I mean, what does it say about what's happening? How many people are dying accidentally? How many accidental deaths do you need to justify six strategically placed cities of refuge that are never more than a day away? I mean, the fact that there needed to be these places of refuge for unintentional killings, it speaks to the depravity of the human heart. Psalm 14, verse 23, this is what God knew. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. And this is not just about good with sin. It's also no one does good with carrying out justice on their own. Despite all that God has done for them, God knew that the depravity of men would still have this massive impact on his people and, frankly, on justice. Man does a good job of corrupting justice on his own, does he not? The list of ways throughout Scripture that God provided different paths to mercy and justice and restoration is a long list. And cities of refuge is just one of many. Now, not everyone needed a city of refuge, of course. But when you did, you were sure glad it was close by and you would run there fast. The fact is, every sin, whether it's accidental and unintentional, or you do it on purpose, every one of them have byproducts and consequences. And the power of sin can twist and malign our lives. Unintentional sin or intentional sin or the sin of someone else, depravity maligns and twists our lives every day. Every sin, intentional or on purpose, they all carry some sort of earthly consequences for us all. But also there are eternal consequences for sin that the unredeemed will face. That is what they need refuge from. See, part of human depravity, see if you can track with me here, part of human depravity is injustice in society. These cities of refuge prevented injustice or vigilante justice. The need for these cities reveals how all of us, whether we know it or not, Desperately need grace and mercy and a place of refuge. The next thing I want you to see is this blood avenger. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the price of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The blood avenger is a reminder to us that the consequences of sin, intentional or on purpose, the consequences of sin are real, and they are all around us. And the blood avenger is sort of like the law, right? The law demands justice. The, the law demands retribution for sin. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. And without protection or refuge from the law's thirst for justice, one day the consequences of sin will catch up to us all. And until then, the blood avenger is hot on our trails because we are, in fact, guilty. I want you to also see, remember the part about the high priest's death wiping the slate clean? See if you can track with me here. The death of whoever the sitting high priest wiping the slate clean, that carries critical, listen, critical theological importance. The ultimate goal of a city of refuge wasn't just merely temporary safety from the posse that wanted to kill you. The ultimate goal was to provide a path to complete restoration. If you were innocent, you didn't want to die. You don't just want to escape the blood avenger. You want to be cleared. You would want to be restored. See, this part of the law concerning the cities of refuge and the high priest made that ultimate restoration, although it may seem like it was far off, it made it possible. There was hope. Once the high priest had died, the accused was free to return home with protection from the law and peace could be restored. You know, when it comes to sin, God's purpose is the same. He provides a path for our restoration. 
to make things right. The restoration is also accomplished through the death of another high priest, the ultimate high priest, our Jesus. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. This is a beautiful connection. Therefore, Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of his people, in the service of God, go back, in the service of God, to die as a payment for the sins of his people. Jesus, the great high priest, also died for those seeking refuge. He died on the cross, wiping away every sin of his people, both past and the present and the future. Christ's death and his resurrection, declared through the gospel, offers restoration and refuge and healing from all the sin that you carry. There's another beautiful picture. Look at these, these cities of refuge that were run by priests, not governors and, and kings like every other city. These are run by priests. These cities of refuge, unlike all these other cities, were given to the priests to live in and to, and to govern. They were run by those whom God designated to be his intercessors between him and his people. Okay, I want you to watch this closely. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Look at this. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So who has been given responsibility to oversee our city of refuge, the church? It's us, a nation of royal priests. Jesus has made his church a city of refuge, a proclaimer of this good news to all that is accessible to all who need it. Find refuge, find restoration, and find healing here in this place. Then the last example is how all of these were accessible. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Look at this. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The cities of refuge were close. Never more than a day's journey away. And just the same way the gospel is accessible to all who believe. The beautiful thing is the gospel is even more accessible than a day's journey. The refuge that the gospel promises and provides... It's just a prayer away. Christ is easy to reach. And those in need of refuge can bring ourselves to this place of refuge anytime, anywhere. All right, that's some good, heavy theology. What about us? What are we supposed to do with this? I want you to see how Jesus is our refuge. And this was the sermon preview this week. Because of your sin, you desperately need a place of refuge. Thankfully, it's not that far away. <laughs> Hebrews 6, 18. Look at this. We who have fled for refuge can have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. It's not a coincidence that this also is in the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> See, there is one glaring difference between the cities of refuge and the refuge Christ offers us through the gospel. One huge difference. The cities of refuge were a provision for those who were not guilty of murder so they could have a chance at real justice. But not the gospel. The gospel is for the guilty. Our depravity runs so deep. Our lives are so filled with sin, intentional or not. That the refuge Jesus offers is available to all at any time, any place, but it's not for the innocent. Our refuge that Jesus offers is for us, the guilty. Jesus is a refuge even after the fact. After you become a follower of Jesus and you're following the Lamb wherever He goes and you screw up and you mess up, you, you say the wrong things, you do the wrong things, you go the wrong places, you know what a follower of Jesus can do? Immediately run to the refuge of forgiveness and repentance. And then one day, when our Jesus returns to eradicate evil, He will provide the ultimate eternal refuge. Look at Romans 15, verse 7. 
Therefore, welcome one another as, as, as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Question, do you think that people see grace life as a place of refuge? <clears throat> a voice calling them to run for refuge from whatever it is they deserve? Yes. I will tell you this, if you are among those who truly have found refuge, I can promise you this, there will be evidence. Let me say it again. If you have truly found refuge, there will be evidence in your life that you have found this refuge. If Jesus has become your refuge, you will have, along with your refuge and your safety, this insatiable desire to provide refuge for others who might be running for their lives as well. See, if you have truly found refuge, and I'm, I'm, I'm challenging you a little, making you a little uncomfortable, if you have truly found refuge, you won't just sit comfortably within the walls of grace and mercy. You'll be inspired to invite others into this refuge. <clears throat> See, that's what makes the church a beautiful city of refuge. It's a collection of guilty sinners who found refuge from what we deserve, and we have become driven by a desire to call out others, inviting them to find refuge that is never too far. Grace life, in fact, is a city of refuge. We are the sanctuary of refuge for souls seeking to be rescued from the penalty of sin. And God has called this vast global network of royal priests, and he's positioned us strategically throughout church history and around the world so that grace was never more than a proclamation of he has made his church accessible in every nation and culture where those he has called out of darkness into light may be and need refuge. And you know, the world around us may not know it, but Grace Life and churches like us who love the gospel, and there are many in our city, we are their only hope for refuge as they run for their lives. We provide an open door for refuge to everyone, regardless of their past, regardless of their present circumstances. And we who have run to refuge in Jesus, you know what? We should be those calling to those around us, run! Run to Jesus before it's too late. Come, join us in this city of refuge we call Jesus and his church. Psalm 62, verse 7 and 8. On God rest my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> See, most of you here today have found within the church and the gospel refuge and restoration from the eternal consequences of your sin. But there are some of you here today, you never realized just how much you needed refuge. Although you always knew that something wasn't quite right. Let me tell you what that feeling was. You felt this anxious need to run from the burden of the sin you've been carrying with you. Even if you don't realize it, you have been desperately searching for refuge from the consequences of your sin. The problem is you've been looking under all the wrong rocks, behind the wrong corners, in all the wrong places. Amen. Some of you have been running from it for so long in desperate search for refuge and restoration from your guilt. You're exhausted, you're tired, and you can barely even breathe anymore. Maybe for the first time, you realize what you deserve today. And today, you have started taking the first step of running to the refuge Jesus provides you. See, that is a sign that God is calling you out of darkness and into light. And your place of refuge can start right here, right now. There's a place of refuge for you here 
on this place we like to call now Mount Lockwood Ridge. So, let us extend to you this invitation today. Let today be the day that Jesus and his church become your city of refuge. Let Jesus through the cross wipe your slate clean through his death on the cross and his resurrection. And if you have never tasted the refuge of Jesus, can I just tell you, it is so close right now. It's right here. Run. Run to the refuge of Jesus. Come learn and grow with the rest of us how our Jesus died for you so that you could have your slate wiped clean. Run. Run to refuge in Jesus and finally be able to return home at rest among his people as we wait for Jesus to return. If this describes you today, let me... In lieu of a closing prayer, guide you privately in your heart and mind with a prayer that you ask Jesus for refuge today. Dear Jesus, I'm tired of running. I'm overwhelmed by the weight and the guilt of the consequences of my sin, both the intentional and the unintentional. Jesus, I'm so tired from running, I can barely breathe, and I feel the consequence of sin bearing down. Jesus, lead me into refuge. Let me in to the city of refuge that is your people. Lord, I pray that you would restore me to what you intended me to be. Lord, give me the desire as I seek this refuge for the first time today. Lord, fill my heart with the evidence that you have done so by giving me a desire to call others who are running to refuge. Jesus, we confess to you that we are sinners. The consequences are too much for us. And we need your mercy and grace. We thank you, High Priest, for dying for us on the cross so that we might live. We cry out to you, God, you are our refuge. You are our strength. You are our help in time of trouble. You are our only hope for salvation. Lord, as we close today, we pray that you would continue to fill the population of this city of refuge with those who are running for their lives. In Jesus' name, Jesus. amen. Amen. amen.